this video we're going to begin to talk about transient conduction and we'll focus on the case where there's no spatial effects think about cooking a roast you take it out of the fridge it's cold whole things at four degrees celsius you put it in the oven and as it cooks if you want to check it to see if it's done you check the temperature in the middle or at the thickest part because you know that's going to be the coolest part in other words you know that not only is temperature going to be dependent on how long the roast has been in the oven on time but you know that it's also dependent on where in the roast you're looking at it's a function of position now think about something with a very high thermal conductivity like copper we take this hot copper ball and we dunk it in a, co a cold bath and if we were able to take a snapshot of the temperature within that copper ball you might intuitively guess that the center of the ball and the edges are going to be super close in temperature. In other words, uh, the temperature is a function of time and not position, or at least that's what you can safely model it as. And if this is the case, you can use what we're going to call the lumped capacitance method. So when can you assume that the temperature is a function of time only? Uh, for this, we need to define the Biot number, which is a dimensionless parameter. It's defined as the thermal resistance to conduction versus the resistance to convection. So you remember that concept of thermal resistance. It's equal to the temperature gradient across which heat transfer takes place over the heat transfer rate. Yes, I know that the concept of thermal resistances was used when we had steady state one dimensional heat transfer, but we're going to use it to illustrate a point here. So on the top, note the temperatures that we've chosen for the conductive resistances um, or co conductive resistance. Uh, this is the this is for the plane for a plane wall with convection at position X equals L. We'll see a picture of that in just a second. Also note that at a given instant, the heat transfer rate is constant. So that's going to divide out. So we can think of the ratio of resistances of heat transfer via conduction to convection as the ratio of these two temperature gradients. The bigger the temperature gradient, the bigger the resistance. Let's look at figure 5.4 from your book to see what we mean by this. So we're looking at a plain wall. So that if there are any spatial effects, it's in the X direction only. Um, and that wall being cooled by convection, the temperature at L and negative L are the same. So the temperature gradient is from the middle to the side at X equals zero to X equals one. And likewise at X equals zero to X equals negative L. Um, so let's look at the first scenario. At the initial time, the entire wall is at a single uniform temperature, Ti. And as time progresses, we see that the temperature in the wall is decreasing. We can also see the temperature distribution of the fluid right next to that hot wall. Um, look at the temperature gradient within the wall. Uh, the temperature gradient or the temperature distribution is pretty flat. Uh, it's a pretty small temperature difference. So the thermal resistance to conduction is low. Compare that to the temperature gradient within the fluid. The fluid, temp the fluid temperature gradient is much higher, so we could say that the thermal resistance to convection is much higher. Since the resistance to conduction is much less than the resistance to convection, the Biot number is very low, much, lo less than, much lower than one. Um, and we can see that because at a given instant in time, the temperature doesn't really vary with position within the wall, the temperature can be approximated to be a function of time only we could see that that is not the case with the other two scenarios. Uh, in the middle scenario, the temperature gradient is, is similar within the wall and the fluid, so the resistances are pretty similar, and therefore the Biot number is close to one. And of course, in the last scenario, we have a large temperature gradient in the wall, um, a large conductive resistance, but a, a small gradient in the, fluid, in the fluid, so a small convective resistance. Um, so now we have the idea of uh, of the physical scenario surrounding a large or a small Biot number. So let's get back to the definition of the ratio of conductive to convective resistance. We well, remember from chapter three what the convect conductive and convective thermal resistances are for a plain wall. Um, and we know that the Biot number should be much, much less than one if we're to assume that the temperature varies uh, only with time, not space. In other words, that the model that we're about to discuss the lumped capacitance method is valid, but how much less than one? Well, your book has come up with a cutoff value of 0.1. If the Biot number is less than or equal to 0.1, then you can assume that the temperature within the medium is a function of time only, and the lumped capacitance method is valid. If you look in other texts, you might find some variation there. Some books give a value of 0.16, uh, but in this class, we'll go with a value of 0.1. Now let's get back to our Biot number. I'm going to rearrange it a little bit and you see that area times the length on the top. The area is the surface area through which heat transfer takes place. That's the surface area into the screen in this picture. That area times the length sure looks a lot like volume, doesn't it? Well, let's look at our plain wall. 
um, or our slab below in this picture. So we could think of this slab, which has a total width of 2L as having thermal symmetry. And that means that I could model this with an adiabatic uh, boundary condition at X equals zero. So the volume that we're talking about here is the volume of that half wall. Um, the heat will not be flowing across the length 2L, but L, the half width of the plane, across where there's a temperature gradient. And finally, we introduce the concept of the characteristic length, which is defined as the ratio of the volume to the surface area. Um, and let's look at what we mean by the characteristic length in detail now. For the shapes we'll talk about here, remember that we're considering that we have taken our medium and we've subjected it to convective heat cooling or heating and the temperature within our medium will be dependent on time. So let's first consider our plane wall with a width 2L. The volume, uh, the, the volume we define our characteristic length um, as the volume to surface area through which heat transfer takes place. And that volume is the surface area into the screen times the length and the area through which heat flows is two times that area. Why? Well, because heat is flowing to the right and the left all, through both of those sides. This works out to 2L divided by L or L, the half thickness of the wall. If we brought in the idea of, of thermal symmetry and calculated the volume of the half wall, that idea works as well. This idea works for a cylinder as well. We take our definition of the characteristic length um, <clears throat> as the ratio of the volume to surface area through which heat transfer occurs. Um, and for the surface or for the cylinder, we have the volume as pi r naught squared times L as the volume. And on the denominator, we have two terms. Uh, the first term accounts for the heat transfer through the area on the ends and the second along the length. Uh, typically, the area on the ends is neglected since that area is small as compared to the area along the length of the cylinder. And that's what we're going to do here. So you see, we've, we, we can simplify it down to R naught divided by two. Let's do it for a sphere. Uh, so we can plug in the volume for the sphere and the surface area of the sphere, and we get R naught divided by three. Now there is a caveat. Um, remember that you're using the B at number to determine whether or not you have any spatial effects that you need to consider. So if you wanna be safe, if you wanna be conservative in calculating uh, whether or not the B at number is less than or equal to 0.1, you define the characteristic length along the length that you have the maximum temperature gradient. So for a shorter cylinder, um, where you might have to consider whether or not you have heat transfer in the radial and Z directions, um, R naught over two is okay. But if you have a long cylinder where you wouldn't even be considering heat conduction in the Z direction anyhow, the only temperature gradient that you're gonna have is from the center at R equals zero to the surface at R naught. Um, so you should calculate your B at number in a conservative fashion to determine whether or not to use the lumped capacitance method. Same thing with a sphere. If you wanna be conservative in determining whether or not you should use the lumped capacitance method, calculating the characteristic length with the radius, and then using that to determine the Biot number, whether the Biot number is less than or equal to 0.1 will be a safer way to go. Now, in your book, they're perfectly happy to go with the characteristic length uh, as the half width of the plane wall, R naught over two for a cylinder, R naught over three for a sphere, and R naught for a long cylinder in which the diameter is much smaller than the length. So that's what we're gonna go with as well when calculating the B at number using the lumped capacitance method. Um, keep in mind uh, that when we start talking about solutions for transient conduction with spatial effects, we'll be calculating the B at number a little differently, but for the lumped capacitance method, these are the characteristics length, characteristic lengths that we'll be using for these simple geometries. We may also work some problems where we use different geometries and we'll actually need to derive a characteristic length to work with the lumped capacitance method. Okay, so we've talked about the lumped, uh, when we can use the lumped capacitance method. In other words, when can we assume the temperature varies with time but not position? Um, of course, we know that uh, there will be spatial effects in reality, but we're wanting to know when those are negligible as compared to how temperature within the medium changes over time. So all this talk about lumped capacitance method, what is it? Well, let's take a hot metal ball and dunk it in a cold bath. We've calculated our B at number and we found that the lumped capacitance method is ap applicable and the temperature is a function of time only. Now let's do an energy balance on the ball. We know that E dot stored is the rate of change of energy contained within the control volume over time. 
since this is certainly not a steady state process, but a transient process, we can't get rid of that. Um, but we aren't gonna sit, consider energy generation, so it simplifies it a little bit. Um, and now, um, if we think, if we think, there we go, if we think about what's going on here, we know that heat is leaving the ball as it cools. And just so you know, we could have certainly modeled this as a cold ball being dunked into a hot bath and we derive at the same result that we're gonna arrive at. So our energy balance looks like this. The rate of heat transfer going out of the control volume is the heat going out by convection. And we could define the rate of heat transfer out of the control volume according to Newton's law of cooling. Uh, note that I put a subscript S on the area since we're talking about the surface area through which heat transfer is flowing. Um, and now note that we've used T as a function of time. Normally we'd see the surface area there, but since the surface area is the same everywhere in the medium, we'll write it like T as a function of time. Um, moving on uh, to the rate of energy stored by the control volume, uh, we recall from thermodynamics that energy can be stored by internal energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. We get rid of the kinetic and potential energy change since we're treating the ball as if it's just sitting there in the fluid. Um, and then since it's an incompressible substance and we're probably not talking about any great temperature change, uh, we might be looking at a temperature change on the order of several hundred degrees and not several thousand. Uh, we can approximate the change in internal energy as C delta T. The C is the specific heat. Sometimes you might see it written as CP. Doesn't matter if it's written as CP or CV. So it's because for an incompressible substance, those values are equal to one another. Uh, then we put the mass in terms of density times volume. And finally, we write the delta temperature over delta time in terms of the derivative of temperature with respect to time. Sometimes you see this written with a dimensionalist temperature theta. And now we separate and integrate. We gather all the theta terms on one side and all the time terms on the other. Uh, we're integrating, um, we're integrating one over theta d theta from some initial theta to a theta at some time of interest and dt from time zero to that time of interest. The integral of one over theta from theta initial to theta is the natural log of theta over theta initial and the integral of dt is just t. Um, I can get rid of that negative sign by distributing it to the left hand side and realizing that my theta initial is now on top and my theta is at the bottom. And then finally, I can rearrange to get an expression for T. So if I know the temperature of the ball at some given instant, I can now calculate how long it took for that ball to reach the temperature after being exposed to the convective environment. But what if I knew how long the ball had been in that convective environment and I just wanted to know what the temperature of the ball was at that particular time? Well, I'd have to go back a few steps. So <clears throat> I would raise each of these to the E and that would get rid of the natural log. Um, and that would allow you to figure out the temperature of the ball if you knew the amount of time that the ball had been in the bath. Now let's say that you're interested in exactly how much heat has left or entered your control volume. So let's apply our energy balance to the ball. This is our first law of thermodynamics applied to a control mass, the ball. Note that I put things in subscript notation so that any heat transfer or work that I would calculate is positive. Um, I'm looking at a cooling process um, and everything's gonna go away except the Q out term and the change in internal energy. Because the ball is a solid and it's incompressible, I assume constant specific heats and I put the delta U in terms of C, delta T, C is the specific heat. Um, and remember that for an incompressible substance, CP and CV are equal to one another, so we don't need to add that subscript. But oftentimes you see it in literature, you see it written as CP. Um, your book just uses C. Um, another thing that your book does is they leave, the, leave off the subscript out. Um, but just know that the Q that you calculate will be a positive number if the ball is being cooled. Um, if you apply this to a ball being heated, you get a negative number. Um, so negative delta T would be what the temperature is before minus what the temperature is after. And once again, because the initial temperature is higher than the temperature at some time after the initial time, then Q will be a positive number. And finally, isolating, um, well, let's see, no, we're gonna put, uh, we'll put theta and theta, uh, put this in terms of theta and theta initial um, because we have some handy relationships that we plan to use uh, shortly. 
Um, notice if we do the math, the theta initial minus the theta at some time t is equal to t initial minus t at some time t. Um, and now, finally isolating theta initial um, and substituting in the definition uh, for theta that we derived not too long ago, we get our final expression for Q. Um, keep in mind that that Q is in joules. I know we have a lot of uh, different notations flying around. Uh, sometimes it's hard to keep it all straight. Well, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.